The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. So we are having on as a guest, Zareen Malva. I first encountered this woman through a random YouTube video actually. And I just saw her, She, was, I think she was speaking to a group of parents, I'm not sure, or teachers. And she was talking about how, why are we giving these little babies this mush food when you know clearly if we look at them, they've got teeth, those teeth are made to do something. And she was, she was kind of talking pretty vehemently about this in a positive way. And she's also an older woman. And I don't mean, I just mean age-wise. She is about as young spiritually and just, you could tell physically, mentally, than I'm just probably younger than 20 and 30 year olds in my mind. But she just, you could tell she knew a tremendous amount about children. And she also spoke from a deep, deep place of care. And it resonated with me. So I reached out, her people kind of got in contact, her pushers said, yeah, yeah, talk with Jesse, and we connected. So I'm excited to show you what that was all about, or at least you can listen in. She, just real quickly on Zareen, she started Montessori at age 21. And this was so far back uh, that the teacher that she was assisting under was literally trained by Maria Montessori. So I have never experienced that yet on the show that somebody was in connection or was kind of trained because she, she worked as an assistant for four years with a woman who, again, was trained by Maria Montessori, I think in London when Maria Montessori was given a course there. So pretty insane. So Zareen worked with three to six year olds for years and years. Now she actually is the director of training at her organization or training organization in India. Uh, let me see the name of that. So I got to get it correct. RTI Montessori Training. Uh, and this is with Association Montessori International. She also heads in a, another organization out there or is actually helps to head an organization out there uh, called the Mo Indian Montessori Foundation. So basically the organization promoting Montessori out in India. So she's up to a lot of uh, awesome things. And I mean, deeply, deeply knowledgeable, wise. You know, I'm trying to find people on here that can can aid us with with years of experience and and this woman brings it. Now we're going to be talking about the inner being or or Zareen will be talking about the inner being. And I put that as uh, I, I put the title as inner being because she's just trying to get at what's what's underlying this child. What is some of the stuff going on that we can't see and we really can't know for sure, but might be contributing to some of the behaviors we see. Uh and helping us to kind of understand what to do with those behaviors as parents and teachers. So we're going to cover a lot. So let me see a few of the topics here. So discipline, saying sorry. I know there's freedom within limits. It, this is going to be more of a discussion. So she, Zareen's the type of woman that I could sit down and just listen to talk nonstop for hours and hours. She reminds me a little bit of my trainer, Sylvia Dubavor, where we would get trained and man, it would be like nine o'clock at night and she would continue to go, go. And I, we were like, Hey, let's just keep at it, you know, and just listening to her. Cause they bring so much wisdom with, I mean, again, decades and decades of experience. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. That's really it for starters. I'd rather you just hear from the woman's mouth herself. So let's hop in. Zareen Malva, thank you so much for being on. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So yeah. I know you've, you've been in this for a very long time. I'm wondering, after all the years, just hopping right into it, um, what would you say is one of the most important things you've learned through the years just being with children? It is very important, and having worked a lot with children over 20 years or so, we feel the most important would be, as Dr. Mandazori always says, Observe, observe, observe. When you're a new teacher, that's very difficult because you're always very anxious and anxiety is very strong. But now after working with many years with children, we realize that without observation and knowing 
the child, understanding the problem, understanding and checking on what it is that the difficulties are with the children before you impulsively start acting on with them. Understand that observation will be your key, which of course, Dr. Montessori, when we learned about it, spoke about. But when you actually work with children, that is a main thing that we have to recognize. That when you know, even why children, anybody, if you understand, if you know, if you observe, if you listen, listen doesn't mean only with your ears. Listen means with your whole being, you have to understand difficulties or what it is that the child is crying for, that a person is asking for, or what is it that you are interacting with. That is the main thing I think we've learned with being with the child. And of course, uh, everything that comes to your mind, you have to be careful, but it's easy to say that we know, but if we can just wait, watch, understand, find out, find out, find out, that's very essential. Then it will be helpful to know how to act. And of course, that's one of the most difficult things, and especially with people who have just started. So we give many teachers or anybody new, even parents, time yeah. before we speak to them. You have to first know, find out. So, so I was just thinking as you're talking, like, because of course, as new teachers, like when you were a new teacher, I was a new teacher, even as a parent, you know, you hear observe and it's, it's kind of like, almost if a lion was about to attack you. And yes, it'd be better to understand the lion a little bit more, but it's about to attack me. What do I do? So yeah. how do you, you know, going back to kind of your early days and think it's to mine and then parents out there that are new or just feel kind of lost. And then we know observe observation is it's the, the fundamental, but how can they integrate that when in front of them, they're just seeing what they think of as like a crazy child or something? How do you integrate observation with that immediacy? I agree, understandable, very good question. It is difficult, it is not simple. In the beginning, you do find it difficult. You do step in, you do make errors, you have mistakes, but we have to understand how the situation goes. You're not going to let a child put his hand in fire, are you? That is obvious, isn't it? That you're going to stop anything that is going to cause harm to the person himself or herself, anybody around. That is why we are always careful when children are with the others. How do you react? What do you do? So the difficulty will be to stop it at once when necessary. So we always think that our job is to first see the situation and act according to the, that's what I mean by observe, act according to the difficulty we are facing. Don't be hypothetical. That is why we can never ever tell parents or teachers what to do. You have to see the problem at that moment, what's happening. And then only can you react, isn't it? So of course, you're not going to let the child get me harmed or you're not going to allow anything that is going to be difficult. But when the child is working and is engrossed and is doing his work, and even though he may be having tantrums or things like whatever you feel is necessary to act. For example, if it's a young child who's having a tantrum, if you keep shouting at him and saying, don't do it, it's not going to help, we know that. But if you just hold the child, whisper in his ear, hold him and let him be, let, have, let him have that backbone of yours to make him feel comfortable. It's all right to have a tantrum. We all have tantrums at times, don't we? We may not verbalize them and we may not show them, but we do. So it's a matter of acting at the right moment in the right time in the right manner. That was her slogan always, at the right time in the right manner. So what are we doing with the child? Or with anyone, if somebody is angry, you don't go and you know say, stop being angry, it's not yeah. going to work, you know that. It's the same thing. You just try your best, do your best and help calm and leave the rest 
The only thing that you are the magical person going to do magic and everything will stop. It's not going to. So yeah. therefore, the limits have to be there. I, you know, I wonder through so much of my experience working with parents, it seems that they look at Montessori teachers as if they're magical and, you know, <laughs> it, it, and trying to get that across them that yes, there, I, I think there's a lot of that's done in the classroom. It's amazing, but teachers mess up. We're not always getting things right. So maybe somebody with your experience that people look at you as like, oh, you're the, you know, you, you know, it all. No, no, can no. you give a, can you give us a time when you, when you, I mean, we'll get to some good stuff maybe you've done, but a time when you messed up and you felt like, oh my gosh, I just really, you know, this, this was no yeah. good. Uh, do you have any experience that come to mind for you with like that? Oh yes. We are always messing up, isn't it? <laughs> with the students too today. So it's not that, you know, it's not something that is wrong, is it? I mean, everybody can mess up. Errors should be your friends. Yeah. It should not be, you know, the, uh, I mean, when we talk to the students, we tell them it's okay. I mean, don't accept, expect to be God or something or to be superior. You are not superior. You are part of this whole community. So act like one. You are a friend to them when you need to be. You are a, a teacher to them when you need to be. You are a uh, you know, mother almost to them and you need to be. So I think it's the way you handle the situation. And the biggest word in my dictionary and in all our dictionaries would be sorry, isn't it? I'm sorry, I messed up. Maybe I was angry at that time. So let us figure this out. Let's come talk it over. Let's see what, and we do that with adults. We do that with children. And I don't think we can expect children to be also never expect them to be 100%, will you? You will not. So what are we thinking who a child is? That's where we come in with the training course. We must know who this child is. Who is this who is born to us? Who is it that we are helping? Why is it we are helping in this manner? Because as we, I always tell people, you know, Montessori can be a prevention. There is no cure. It's not a cure. So if you ask me for answers, you go to a doctor to get a cure. But if you are asking me for answers, I will never have any answers for any situation. Yeah. Oh, if this happens, if my child does this, what should I do? All that comes to us. But yeah. at that moment, what is happening? Where it is yeah. happening? Why is it happening? That's what you have to figure out. And do yeah. your best. Do, do your best. You can't I wonder if... I wonder if over the years, have you seen more of a desire for like a quick fix? You know, like if somebody goes to a therapist, a lot of times they think, oh, this person's going to fix me, you know? So have, has it been the same over all the years that you've been in Montessori? Or do you think it's gotten kind of more where people are like, tell me what to do, Zirin, please. Has it gotten more like that or it's always been like that? No, I think it depends on the anxieties of the parents. As when you're talking to parents, when you know the difficulties they are facing, we may be facing the same difficulties at school. Sometimes it happens that the parent is better with the child than you are, or vice versa. So you have to get the, to the bottom of the difficulties, find out why this, this child is having obstacles in his life like this, what is going wrong, where it's going wrong. Like a major example we always have, if there is a, a child and the second sibling is coming within two years, you will find that older child has a lot of problems because you know that is natural that an older child will feel difficulty when the second child is there and <laughs> the child's attention has gone to the small baby, naturally that's going to be a difficulty. Now, of course, most parents will accept, expect that. But besides expecting that, it's hard to manage it. Yeah. So then we tell them if you can involve the child in something, if you can get the child to be natural and you become natural with the child, why the difficulties are lying, what is happening. So I think you have to make sure the dialogues you have not only dialogues in verbally, as I say, but it's the way you handle the child, the way you do things with the child. 
all these sort of things are important. So it's your reaction, the way you act. If there is difficulty, don't try to have the, you know, light the, the fire is already lighted, as we said. Don't try to get the flames even more. <laughs> so get, I, get to the bottom of it. I'm curious with this one, Zarin, because you gave this kind of practical example of siblings. So, you know, in training, what I found and working with so many teachers through the years is that I often find that they're very good with materials. So they know how to do the materials very well. It's, you know, with AMI training, it is like you are ingrained how to work with these materials. But let's say you do have siblings or even siblings at home for parents. The idea of you know, a lot of parents will be with siblings at home, they might say, Oh, you're going to be a big brother, you're going to love your little sister, and they go on and on and on, you know, and you maybe you can comment on that. But in the classroom, too, I don't see that the training about how to just be with a child kind of spiritually that that kind of that, how do I interact with a child who's having trouble having a tantrum? Or how do I interact with a sibling like that? Um, what do you do in the training to aid your teachers that are coming out of this, or maybe when you're speaking with parents in situations like that, um, so that they're now you, you don't know the specific child, of course, but so at least they have some principles or some guidance so that they can adapt to the child in front of them. How, what do you do? Yes, we try to help them understand that these are normal, natural things. So in order to handle anything like that, you will have to calm yourself down accept the difficulties you're facing and then act in the right manner. So again, it will depend a lot on the child concerned, isn't it? If the child is a child who is able to get it and understand it, then you go further than that. But if the child is not able to handle it, then you have to be the backbone again and help the child and calm the child and make sure that you give equal attention and we cover all that in the course. We do hmm. expect that you give them what we call the assistential approach. So what that means is you have to understand that there is an inner being that the child has. And very often, the child acts from this inner being more, especially the very young child, the birth to two and the birth to three child will definitely act more from his inner being, isn't it? That inner call is very essential to accept that he does have this. We are not fixers, we are not the people. We are only on the periphery. We are only going to help the child as much in the environment as we can in this physical environment that we live in, in the outside environment, even the emotional environment, all the environment that he lives in. So we try to help the students understand that we cannot touch his inner being. Nobody can touch your own your inner being except yourself, isn't it? So in the training, we make them realize that we are not fixers. We are not people who can you know, wave a wand and work. You have to give the child the leeway, the understanding, the help that he needs at that time. But definitely know that he has something more powerful often to obey. And that is why she talks a lot about the sensitivities that the child has. So we know those sensitivities, when the child will have what problems, and that the cause comes in because of that. Because we do the whole birth to 24 years, the whole idea about the human being, how the child changes, what happens at what age. So giving that understanding to the student, the student gets the whole picture of what the human being is, of what this child is. So if you know, often we never ask the child's name if there is a difficulty, we always ask the age. Why? Because we know if it's a six-year-old, how you would react. If it's a three-year-old, what reaction will you have? So that is where we come in. Even the six to 12, they have different difficulties. They have different sensitivities. So once you know that whole framework of the human being, that's what this course is all about. When you know what it is all about, then you will react and act with the child or with the adult or with whoever it is, according to what he needs. And that is what we believe in. I completely believe, what about I, leave alone I. But we all believe that the child knows from, inner, from his inner being what he needs. 
Mm. And that's the biggest discovery, I think, your Dr. Mandasar is me. Mm. He knows what it is all about. He has to comfort himself. He has to be about his personality has to be happy. So therefore, the reactions come. So therefore, your acting on top of that is not going to help. You have to accept that he has this inner being, he has this, and we, we have to have this assistential approach, this approach which is so important. And so that's where the observation comes in. So let me let me ask you. So just going back, because let's let's go back to kind of our pre-Montessori days before we knew about Montessori. <laughs> so for for me, it's you know I thought it's a long time, over fifteen years. You, I'm sure it's much much longer. But that idea of the inner being, or that the child somehow knows what he needs, whereas we as the educators, we're just assistants, or we're just you know the assistential approach. I think facilitators. facilitators it can seem very foreign because just a concrete example. If, if I let my, say my three and a half month old, you know, roam around, just roll around, he could roll off, hit his head and, you know, he's in trouble. So it, it seems to conflict with this inner being. Now I, I know it doesn't, I'm sure you know it does, but how do you respond to a parent who's like, it's, it's just, oh, it's obvious that that's not true because the inner being would, my child would go and run in front of the car. You know, am I supposed to just, you know, follow his inner being? Is that what you're saying? You know, so how do you respond to something like that? That's why it's very difficult to talk about it literally. It's not a literal idea. The idea is spiritual, isn't it? That you have this, which will help you. And we often talk about saying what happened to the child from conception to birth. Did anybody go to help him? The environment was formed by nature. It was very natural. It was there. Mm -hmm. So everything went all right, unless, of course, there were problems. But and he did form himself, didn't he? Came out to be a viable human being when he was born. Now, that means there is something within him, isn't it? OK, so after birth, what happens? After birth, we do. We, he comes into this strange environment where everything is so different. And now, what are we doing to help him? What is this environment we will provide? So therefore, if we accept that he has some inner thinking of his own, I mean, his personality to form, he obviously comes with something. That's where we tell the students that realize the fact that he has coming with something, isn't it? He's not a complete zero. He has to have something. So now when he's coming in, the things he has to achieve within those first two, three years, what is it that he has to achieve? So if we know what he has to achieve, now he has to learn to walk, he has to learn to talk, he has to learn to do so many things. We know that. But we see the manifestations afterwards. But what is happening in the mind for all that? What is happening? So the brain gets formed. And what is happening in the brain? So the brain is doing all that work. And who is doing it? The child himself is doing it. So how can you say there is no nothing with him? There is something, right? We accept that. So after you accept the fact, that's what I'm saying, acceptance of realizing who this child is, then we can see his sensitivities come forth and how, when, where. So knowing all this, that the child has to walk, has to talk, has to do things, then what is the help we can give? And we can only give, provide that much, but he has to do the work. Yeah. He, the okay. being, so if we accept that the being is important, that human being forming himself, yeah. he constructs himself. You cannot construct a leg or an arm for a child, can yeah. you? Just as before birth, he did. So therefore, there is something within him. So that's what we're asking them to accept, that there is something. So go along with it, find the right way to help him, see the environment to provide. So we are on the periphery, as we say. So we have to provide the environment at the right time, in the right way. Yeah. So if he's going to walk, and we know he's going to crawl and walk. Then if you put everything against him and put glass things and put things, he's not going to be able to, is he? So that is where we are saying that we have to help them understand that. So I, I think that is very natural to understand. And parents yeah. know it also. Yeah. So I think I think got that across, but I don't know how else. No, no, I think that's good. So you, I mean, you're getting back to basics because it's like nobody's going to deny that somehow 
whether it's a human being or any other animal, somehow we're going to make it breathe or we're going to make it if a dog bark, like it's there, like that's a part of its nature. And with human beings, children are unique in that they're forming their very sense of self, like they are creating themselves. And I think that's a very Montessori uh, outlook on young children, because usually uh, when I first got into education, definitely when I was in college studying, there was this sense that the real development of the self happens in like your teenage years and when you grow up. And the, the idea that young children were forming themselves, it just would have been no. So I think that's a very Montessori and very unique perspective um, on human being. I think it's true and I've seen it, but um, I don't recall seeing it anywhere else in terms of the intellect forming one's own intellect. Um, have you seen it anywhere else? You, you think of it as a Montessori fundamental. It's also sorry fundamental, but it's once you start working with children and follow the child, and it's that's why we all keep on saying, why do you keep saying Montessori? There's yeah. nothing like Montessori. You have to understand we are talking about the child. And if we get that, if the student gets the idea that the child is very important, what is he getting? What is he learning? How is he how is he finding in things in his environment? Does he need this? Does he not need this? What is when you are working with the child, when you're being with the child, when you're there, you will see all this automatically. And therefore, we don't talk about monster, we're talking about the child who we yeah. observe and we know now. So therefore, we want them to discover that. We yes, don't want yeah. to say it's there. We want yeah. them to see it, but the we are just itself. giving them a little hint as to look for that, look for that. That's my observation. Yeah. Look for it, look for it. You'll see it. You'll yeah. see it. I get and what you're saying, I, I mean, I, I love your perspective because I think what we're seeing today is I, I get a lot of questions um, and I see it online. What, you know, how do I become more Montessori? Like it's very, <laughs> it's almost, and I find this in movements generally, but it's somewhat cultish. You know, it's like, I want to be more Montessori. And what you're saying is, yeah, then then look at the child. I mean, that's, that's the core. And I wonder, um, just having that perspective, I think of Montessori as, as, as you started with observation, she's a scientist. She's saying, look at the being in front of you. Whether Whatever thing it happens to be, whether it's a specimen or it's a, a human being, you have to look at it. So with, with that kind of in mind, I'm curious. You've been, in this a lot, you've been in this a long time. We've got Montessori, who came up with a theory, and she had different ideas. If you read her book, sometimes she'll comment on things that Oh yeah, you know, it's all over the place. She comments on all sorts. So, is there anything in your experience with children that you have come to through your own observation where you look at something that Maria Montessori herself said that you say, actually, this doesn't fit with my own observations? Has there been anything? I'm curious. You know, in the beginning, of course, you had so many doubts. We had so many doubts, right? Mm -hmm. Even when we did the materials, we had so many doubts. Whatever we learned also, of course, you have doubts. Nobody believes it when you do the course. You can't believe all this, right? As you said, <laughs> impossible. I agree entirely. But through the years, I'm so old, through the years, we see it happening right in front of us. But why, as I keep saying, why are we talking about only child? We see it in human beings also all the time. We see it everywhere. So if you don't have that humility to accept, if you don't have that understanding to say sorry, if you don't know what do you mean by sorry, what do you mean by thank you, what is it that we are you know, living with? We are living in a community. We are living as a social being. We are social beings. So how can we live unless we try to make it better? So we always say that if you want to do this course, all we are asking you is look at yourself and try to be better. You can't be your best. Nobody can be the best. So try to become better. That's the whole idea of Montessori. Montessori yeah. means first try to become be better. better. Now, how will yeah. you become better? By accepting people as they are, by doing things what you think is the best, by giving an environment to anybody and everybody who requires that environment or that. And I, when I keep on saying environment, I don't mean the physical environment. Yeah. I'm talking about the emotional, the social the intellectual, the psychological, the physical included. All of it. So, isn't yeah. it? So now what are you doing for that? What are we doing for that? So yeah. 
it's a it's a it's not as we say dr mangeshwari always say the human being is an integer you can't break him up yeah. you know you can't say oh emotionally is like this and physically is like this yeah. no a it's a human being it's a whole yeah. being and therefore we are talking about this being as being something very precious especially the child yeah. and therefore who is this human being born to us and who is this person who we are going to help and we yeah. try our best there is no I, better and I, i mean i like that you're getting to the point that this you know, every human being is an integrated person, whether they're integrated well or not, they, we're all, it's all united. Um, and I'm curious, because you said something that I never thought of, but you were talking about, you said like the sorry or the thank you, how you do that, because you can, somebody can say sorry, and it means nothing. And somebody can tell you sorry, and you just felt like this person gave their whole being to you and their apology. And I want, I just, I was thinking about in America, with the, just a lot of people will do something that, that is supposedly wrong, whether it's not, and then they'll apologize publicly. And sometimes you can see the, di the difference between a real apology and a phony apology. And it just hit me that, you know, in Montessori, we don't force apologies on children. We don't say you have to say sorry, no um, but I can see how that can have a lasting impact because people, the children feel like, oh, I got to say sorry, but I don't really mean it, but I'll say it. And, and now we can see adults doing the same thing as adults. So I'm curious, just let's take that one thing, because I want to get some practical guidance for a parent. If a child does, if you, if a child does something you think is wrong in the crap in the classroom, Zareen, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you go up and say, Hey, you need to say sorry to your friend. Like, how do you, how do you deal with it? No, 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 we don't say, say sorry or anything like that. Parents also shouldn't do that. No, we cover, we do it and follow it according to what has happened. And then we follow it up by making a general, you know, group and uh, helping them understand how one behaves. So because our behavior is never all perfect. Can anything be perfect? No way. No human being can be perfect. So we try to help them understand in groups and we do grace and courtesy a lot. So again, it will depend on the age of the child. If it's a two-year-old, of course, what are you going to expect? If it's a five-year-old, okay, what are you going to expect? So, you know, it depends how the child has been throughout. And if you know that child, uh, it will come gradually. So nothing comes to the child so quickly. You can't expect anything quickly. You know, like saying that a three-year-old, you tell him, do this, and he's going. And I don't know, and Dr. Monsoy talks about the three levels of obedience. That's a fascinating idea of hers. She always says that the obedience will come only when you understand what that other person is asking of you. Right now, yeah. obedience to most people is discipline. Yeah, That's not what yeah. we're talking about at all. Yep. Obedience means understanding what it is that is somebody asking of me. And then we figure out, right? I will obey only if I'm comfortable, right? As yeah. adults, we will only do that. But as a child, you have to accept that, that it will take him time to realize who this person is. Do I obey her or do I not obey her? Yeah. It's the same thing happening in a family, isn't it? The child may obey the father but he may not obey the mother mm -hmm. because he knows where the mother is coming from he can feel what the mother is feeling when she's trying to help her, the child so the feelings the emotions the understanding child is not stupid which we know that so help the you know. child to understand how we are living what is it that we're expecting that is why again the environment comes in how yeah. are we acting around it? and i'm, I'm happy you and I'm happy you raised obedience there because I, I've rarely talked about the word obedience on the podcast, but Maria Montessori uses it quite often. And as oh, yeah. you said, this is not what a lot of people think of today, like, you know, some theocratic or very dict dictatorial government or mother. Oh. It's, you know, and, and I think she even connects it with true freedom requires a certain amount of obedience. So can you maybe um, clarify that for like, why would we want my three-year-old to be obedient? And what, what does that mean in a, in a kind of a more child-focused uh, approach or Montessori approach? Absolutely. No, that is why we begin first. Obedience is one of the last things we talk about. But the first thing we have to understand is freedom should be granted to the child. But what do we mean by freedom? We always talk about freedom within limits. 
So the limits have to be set for him. Even in our household, we'll have limits. So if you tell the child very clearly, even a young year, child of one year old, if you make him understand that this is the limit you have, they will understand. They will not do it. But we do not have this understanding that you have to help him when he needs it and you show him the limit, act out the limit, know the limit, then if you are doing it, then he will understand and have to follow the limit, isn't it? So the limits that we set should be very sensible, practical. So if it's a three-year-old, what limits does he have? If it's a six-year-old, what is the limit he has? So you have to know how the child will arrive at this freedom. Because freedom is not something that you become free in the sense that that is license. She always says that it's license. license. You can't go to somebody's house and steal something. Can you will you? <laughs> you don't. But you know that is not the freedom we are talking about. We are talking yeah. with responsibility, with understanding. Yeah. I remember once my niece was there, she was about seven years old, and she went and took an apple from uh, somewhere, you know, on the table, and uh, it was outside, and I, you wouldn't have expected her to, to be a young child and things. So she said, oh, my aunt told me, my other aunt told me to go and bring it. I said, but where's your responsibility? Do you think you can take something from someone mm. like that? stable Great. and what about you you are seven you are not two so let's see yeah. what do you think do you think you should just go and become somebody six like yeah, that yeah that's oh, great God. so that's what i'm saying the limits have to be understood by the yeah. child and i, I man I, I that's it and that's a great example because you're saying basically an older child who's saying oh well my adult told me it's okay well that's irrelevant that some other adult told you that. What do you think? Like what? So I, that's fantastic. I want to, you know, I was just doing something on switching phones and I was at Verizon, this, you know, cell company. And <laughs> there was, he must have been about eight years old, super excited child, fun. You could tell he'd be a fun to be around, but he's running around the store, like literally running around the store. And the mother, you could stay at a fun relationship and so forth. But I thought to myself, this is inappropriate, like literally yeah. running around. But, but I could tell that it was in his eyes. This was like, Oh, I'm, this is good that I'm able to run around. The mom was like, Oh, that's just my, my fun child. You know, he, he's plays soccer a lot. He's got to get that energy out. And I thought he hasn't learned obedience. And I, I doubt the mom knows obedience, but, you know, yes. like, so in a situation like that, I, I'm, I have my own take obviously, but what do you do as an onlooker? You're, you know, Zareen, you're in New York City right now. I know you'll be flying back to India pretty soon. But what do you do in a shop when that's occurring? Do you just mind your own business? Do you do something? What's your take on that? 90% of that time I do stop. I would walk, go to the child and say, please, this wow. is not the place. And I'm getting very really disturbed about it. So if he's an older child, he'll follow. Now, if it's a very young child, then you would expect you can't do much because you know a two-year-old or three-year-old will not understand. Yeah. But if it's a six or seven-year-old, like very often it's so irritating when you're sitting on your seat in the, the other day, somebody was asking me, what do I do? Uh, you know, I've been sitting in my seat on the, in the airplane, <laughs> aeroplane, and somebody behind is pushing my seat, you know how they go. Yeah. Children do. Push your seat, pushes your seat. So then you, I just got up and I said, excuse me, I'm getting very disturbed. I think I'll start getting a headache also. Yeah. I'm quite getting disturbed. I want to sleep also. I really appreciate if you do not do this. Okay? I really appreciate it. Of course, it went on after some time for a little while longer. But yeah. then I think he realized what I meant. <laughs> it is thinking, yeah. I thought. And then he did stop. So, I, and it's also the way you help that child because you are yeah. totally the onlooker now. You are not knowing this child, right? Yeah, yeah. Then it's different. If you know the child, there's a different reaction from yeah. you. Then you will say, no, we know the rules here. Excuse me, can we just remember and try? And so at that time, you don't get upset. But later on, the parents should expect, and therefore, when children, parents are there, they should help the child to understand before you take the child anywhere, how to act, what to yeah. do, where to do things. All that should be what we call, you know, in our, in our language in Gujarati, we say, Kelavni. Kelavni means, have you got that within you from home that you know how to mm. behave outside? How do you say that? 
it's a gujarati word but it's in my language kelavi uh, obviously that child has not got kelavi from home <laughs> as you said so, the mother herself has a difficulty so how yeah. do you do it so it really depends and you can't Situation. correct everybody in the world you can't help everyone in the yeah. world but you do your best and i've done that several times i've not once i've done it i remember when i was uh, picking up my luggage in an you know, after coming on the aircraft there was a, a husband and wife team and uh, there, is, there was something i trish asked me and we were waiting for our baggage so anyway we were waiting so i was waiting long for it and uh, we were waiting long so obviously i had a conversation for almost 20 minutes so i, I was saying what i do and all that kind of thing and then some questions he asked me about what do i do with my child like this so then i was telling him about what sorry what it is and you should do this with your child and not do this uh, read to the child do this, uh, all that went on and then you won't believe after 15 years he contacts me i couldn't believe it and he told me that we remembered what he had told us and we really wow. did it and that was a big shock to me i thought yeah. Yeah, no, i think you can have it. a i think with, with a little i can go on like this with examples because it's just amazing if children are understood yeah that's all you need to do you have to understand the child and realize you are not the be all and end all you are only a part of his life and therefore you must act like that and be part of him yeah. not be big you know the father is not the god or whatever so be putting fear in them giving them all this nonsense that we do now it is is so difficult Yeah, the way out is being more permissive than being helpful. Sometimes you wonder whether it was the old generation was better when they were very strict, or sometimes you wonder whether this permissiveness is better. But where is the middle path? That's yeah, what and I, the the way you're talking about it, because I I'm gonna have to do an episode on this in intervening with a child or when a child does something to you, because the way you talked about it, even on the airplane or the child walking running around is. you're not doing this to just teach a lesson it's not like oh i'm going to i'm going to turn into teacher mode but you have you have this respect for a child and you say you Absolutely. know i i respect your what you were saying the inner being and i'm going to talk to that person you know and and i know like you said you he gets it or she 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 knows where you're what you're talking about but you're Absolutely. talking to them as another human being not as you know up here right. looking down you need Got to it. stop running you know or stop yeah. kicking my seat little oh, child no, no. so i think even in your manner exactly. of doing it yeah you're showing the respect you're setting the limits which is the old school you know there's limits but it's the more it's the new school or the more emotional i'm going to set a limit but i'm going to have i'm going to tell you why this is the reason or you know it's according to their nature as as you've talked about um and i want to ask you something i don't know i'm curious culturally in india when some things occur but there was something that occurred i think it was a few months ago there was a concert where a bunch of the concert goers broke down the the entry way and i think they got through and it just it just came to my mind about limits so if we don't set the environment with certain limits we're we should expect chaos you know that's what we should expect if we don't and I'm wondering in you know in America there seems at times to be like well people should just you know you should be free to attend a concert or you should be free to just run out on the street like is in India do is there a general cultural respect for limits or is it more you know moving towards the permissive and anything goes kind of like I think the trend is in America <laughs> it is going but it's not as bad because how uh the systems we have the culture we have the education we get and it's part of the indian as i always say we have 2000 years of history mm -hmm. and america is 200 or 300 years of history yeah. that is still there a lot isn't it that mm -hmm. respect for the human being that our understanding the way we speak to each other but again it is the western world is seeping in as we know it happened in japan japan completely lost it in one sense when they got this whole western culture in so quickly but we have to realize that we are not a country of one people we have yeah. so many varied cultures 
Yeah, so in many, India in particular, so it's massive. Yeah, yeah. So for us, it has been, and as they say, India will not have a revolution because we also have the caste system. But that's not the best thing either, because there they are made to think that you are to be subdued and you have to understand that if you are born a Harijan, you will always be a Harijan, you know, yeah, yeah. Out, untouchable. Mm -hmm. So that is a negative. But in the caste system also, we learn respect and that there are good things also. So you have to sieve out the bad and know the good to follow that. So if, yeah. as I keep on saying, if you are nice, the world will be nice. Yeah. If you are nice to someone, if you are understanding, you are able to handle the situation in your best way possible, then it won't matter whether you're talking to a, a sweeper or whether you're talking to the prime minister. Yeah, yeah. That, that understanding of knowing what a human being is because that was both are human beings but yeah. then which is the respect how do you respect this person compared to that person what is it that you're doing so i think your being shows and what are you are you willing to change yeah. are you is that ego still there that ego gets in our way we know all that that is all psychology today isn't it? That's, why, that's why i keep on saying we are not the cure we are trying to prevent these things yeah from and you the and i because you you tend to get at the core of these things i know maria montessori <laughs> talks because we're talking about almost the quote extremes you know one is that you keep your head down and you know you walk with your eyes to the ground and you never look up because i know Montessori talks about that, you know, as a society, we need to start looking up, you know, opening our eyes. And that's with the observation. But then when you mentioned the ego, then on that other extreme, I don't know how I formulate it, but then you think you are above everything. And this happens throughout history, but you think that you are a god that can, you know, rule over people, tell people what to do. Um, so it's like, we don't want to be the person who, who puts our head down and just tell, expects other people to tell us what to do but we also don't want to be the person who thinks we're going to rule over others right That's and it seems like those are the two elements that children pick up on and they're either like ruled over at home or they're the ruler of the house at home absolutely you know? That's what the environment comes in. Is it an environment that is helping the child in that respect? That's what we mean by giving them the correct way of doing things or the mm -hmm. correct norms. If the norms are there, the limits are there, the understanding is there, then the child will never go astray that way, yeah. isn't it? Uh, so it's us who have to change. Yeah. Never expect the opposite person to change. I always tell my students, point your finger this way, not this way, this way. <laughs> Find out where you have yeah. gone wrong when there is a situation to handle. Find out where you have gone wrong. Whether it's a mother-in-law, as we say, you know, I told the mother-in-law is a very famous example because we have that whole thing about living in with the mother-in-law and that goes on. I remember mm. with a maid in my environment at school. A maid? I remember a maid who was working okay. with us, you know, helping us in the kitchen and all that. Mm. So she always used to complain about her mother-in-law. So I said one day, one day you put yourself in her shoes you take you know in our culture the mother-in-law keeps the keys of the house in her sari very common oh. at home that's a very big thing at home <laughs> so i said you imagine you've got the key now and you are the head of the household and what are you going to do how will you do it what will you do in her, in her place when things happen? You know, she has to think of her son. She has to think of you. She has yeah. to think of your children. So many things to think. Have you ever thought of putting yourself in her place and seeing how to mm -hmm. do, work in this environment? If you are doing something wrong or doing something that she doesn't like, then in the same token, you know, she doesn't like what you do. Yeah. So what about that? So yeah. have you tried to change? You expect her to change? All that went on for about 15, 20 minutes. I spoke to her after six months, four months, and then she would threaten her to say, I'm going to my house, meaning the mother's house. That's very common at home. You know, you mm. leave your husband's house and go to the mother's house. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that is very typical of their culture, not our culture. Okay. So I said, what do you want to do? So then she told me, you know, after six months, I've not left the house yet. Uh. <laughs> So that means that she understood something. I yeah. said, see, you have not to look at the world through your eyes. 
look at the world through the other person's yeah, eyes. Yeah, try to understand them. Yeah, that's it's good. And I, I mean, coming maybe coming full so circle many to things the, to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, that's why I was saying, I was talking, everybody out there, I was talking with Zareen before this and said, like, I could listen to Zareen for hours. I, you know, I want to respect the audience and get a sense of, I don't know exactly. how long they could go. Um, exactly, but, I agree. And I, but, but coming full circle with you, I'd say, you know, you just saying, look at the other person's shoes or get in, get in their perspective. And I think ultimately it's the same with the child. Like our observation is to see, well, where is this person coming from? this little, you know, this little human, but they're a human being. So um, I appreciate your perspective. I'm happy I found you. You're one of the few people that I actually found and thought I need to reach out to this person. Um, and I'm just, I'm trying to get the OGs. I told Zareen she's an OG and I don't, Zareen, you know OG? Do you know what that means or no? No, not particularly. Uh, okay, that's, it's like an American, yes. it's like, it, it, it literally means I think original gangster. Like, not that you're a gang member, obviously, but like you're. Oh, no. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree entirely because I will not give up. I will not. Give yeah, up. there you and go. When it comes to the child. Yeah. I think that we have to work very hard. As Dr. Pondisari says, we have to be knights of the child and mm. K N I G H T, knights of the child and help the child as any child, every child as much as we can. So, every child and every parent we are talking to, we are trying to save that child from un in very good intention parents, but not knowing the right thing. So yeah. if you can reach anyone like that, that is one of the main reasons that we are doing this course, isn't it? That we try to help. And that's why Dr. Montessori started the courses because she thought I've helped the child for 22 years. Now I know, now let's go. At, actually, it is nothing to do with the child. It's to help the outside world, the parents. To, and therefore she started the course, giving the course to parents. Yeah. I, so and this I, course is for parents. So many people say there's no course for parents, but I think this is an ideal course for parents because if yeah. parents understand, then you are saving every child, any child. Yeah, and I would I double down on that with Zareen saying if you if you have the time and the money to take the course, it's not just to become a teacher. You know, parents could in, gain incredible. And something just to the note that you said, Maria Montessori spent many many years with children before teaching others about children so i'm just noting this because yeah i come i came to zareen because she's old school and she's been in this for a long time just for some of the young monastery just be i'm just giving a, a be careful note when you leave the classroom early oh i've worked with children you worked only one year with children and then you want to go teach parents and teachers about children i would i'm just giving a warning sign <laughs> It's tour, stay with the children a little bit longer, do that observation, get your, get your feet wet, as they say, before you start becoming the expert out there. I don't know if you agree, Zareen, but I'm just putting that out there from my own perspective, from what I've seen. So. Definitely, you need definitely to be with the child, know the child, understand the child before you start speaking. And she also did that, she herself said that we were working quietly for 20 long years, how many disturbed us, she said, but yeah. after she recognized the fact that, you know, and her son goaded her into thinking that, no, you have to let the world know yeah. what it is that the child is. And that's why she started, she was not interested in she just wanted to, the people to know, like I'm saying, you know, the same thing. The child is what you have to know. You have yep. to know the child to help this child. You must help. Well, Zareen, child thank you. Us. Yeah, thank you again. And I'm, I, you thank know, you. I love that we're ending with the child. And again, thank you for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Thank yep. you. All right, coming out of our conversation, I just want to offer another huge thanks to Zareen uh, Malva for for being with us today. Wonderful, wonderful. I also want to emphasize that she does have a training center and she it's not just for teachers, parents can join in. And I got to tell you, if I was, if I hadn't been trained already, and I was maybe a, you know, maybe 15 years ago, boy, I would hop into her program because you could live in Mumbai, where she's training. And it's one of the cheapest or most inexpensive programs for AMI, Association Monastery International that I know of in the world. Uh, I know if you're going in America, it gets pretty expensive. Now there are some great places where you can be trained in America, but imagine you can jump to India 
be trained, live in Mumbai for a few months and spend, I think Zareen was telling me something around like a thousand US dollars. I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, but anyway, so let me give you her site number. So it's Montessori. So you know how to spell Montessori. If you don't look it up, Montessori dash Mumbai. So M U M B A I dot org. All right. Check out Zareen there. Check out what her training center is up to. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. That's really it for the show today. Again, huge thank you to all of you uh, writing in, leaving comments, reviews, liking these videos or podcasts, sharing them with friends. It's just awesome how this thing is growing. And I should say, if you're reaching out to me, just please be aware. I'm trying to get to all the emails, but now I'm getting a lot more emails. I'm getting a lot more speaking requests. Um, as most of you know, if you've been listening to the show, we're also opening our little schoolhouse here in South Florida. So there's a lot going on. I'm trying to ensure I get on all of it. But if you don't hear from me for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a month, it's not because you know I don't want to get back to you, but there's just a lot going on. Uh, anyways, I hope your lives are rocking and rolling and uh, we will talk next time. Adios.